Uh, so 13 here is about gases. We're obviously gonna talk about uh, uh, gases and different gas laws that we will uh, see here. We'll also talk about some gas stoichiometry in, in this equation or in this chapter as well. So let's get started with substances that sort of exist as gases under sort of normal conditions. So under normal conditions, you know, that's usually kind of table type conditions that you find for uh, in books and so forth. And normally what that is, is sort of like a room temperature of 25 degrees Celsius uh, and also a pressure of one atmosphere. Uh, one ATM is an atmosphere, a unit of pressure. And that is typically what kind of normal conditions are uh, thought of as. And under those sort of normal conditions of 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, ionic compounds typically are not found as gases under temperature. And that's really because ionic compounds are cations and anions. And those guys are held together by very strong electrostatic attraction, kind of opposites attract. And that is like pretty much your uh, kind of super strong attraction that you could get. So under these conditions, you know, it really doesn't happen. Even if you apply a good amount of heat to it, uh, you will not like transform something like sodium chloride into like the gas phase or anything like that. Uh, we, we saw this as well earlier on when we did some experiments where, uh, you know, we had some salt water basically and we evaporated off the water and you're left with the kind of just the salt that was left there in your evaporating dish. Uh, you could heat the heck out of that thing and uh, it pretty much will just melt. Uh, we will not go really into the gas phase because uh, to overcome that really strong attractive force between uh, that cation and anion in the solid phase, you know, it takes a lot, a lot of energy to do so. And it really doesn't happen. It will really start to melt before it actually even kind of tries to go into the gas phase. So covalent compounds, though, which are obviously our guys, our molecular compounds, which are our nonmetals and nonmetals together, uh, they are very different than sort of ionic compounds. So a lot of molecular compounds, uh, they actually are gases at room temperature, sort of room conditions, uh, things like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, that's hydrogen chloride gas, that's ammonia gas, uh, CH4 is methane. Uh, which is your simplest organic guys, the stuff that comes out of the uh, pipe there when we light a Bunsen burner, basically. Uh, those guys pretty much will exist as gases under normal conditions. The major difference between sort of an ionic compound and a molecular compound is unlike an ionic compound, uh, molecular compounds are held together by kind of weaker intermolecular forces between the molecules. And what that means is much, much easier uh, you can convert a molecular compound into a gas than you can an ionic compound. Uh, the pretty much simple example that we're all probably familiar with is good old H2O there. H2O is obviously normally found as a liquid, uh, but not with a lot of effort, just some fire, right? Get it to about 100 degrees and you can convert it obviously very simply into uh, sort of the gas phase. And that's because when water molecules are together. They are held together because water is polar where oxygen is more negative. Hydrogen is more positive because of that polarness. They are held together by what is referred to as hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is what is known as an intermolecular force. It is much, much weaker than an intramolecular force, which is like what holds an ionic compound together. Intramolecular forces are the ones that hold an individual sort of molecule together. Intermolecular forces are ones that hold two different molecules together, like two water molecules. So if we look at just the water molecule by itself, the covalent bonding that is happening here between the hydrogen and the oxygen on both sides, that is what is known as an intramolecular force within the molecule, is that's the force that holds that together. The bond here between this entire water molecule and the other one is an intermolecular force. And intermolecular forces are always much weaker. And that's because when we start heating something like water, the first bond that breaks is actually the bond between the two different water molecules. And that allows each water molecule basically to escape into the gas phase. If it was opposite and the intramolecular force was weaker when we would start heating, we would break these bonds, get hydrogen gas and oxygen gas being made. And that's probably not really great if you're hitting it with a fire at that point. So 
Uh, because that intermolecular force, the force that holds the two water molecules together is much, much weaker than the internal forces that hold individual water molecules together, uh, is much easier to kind of convert it into the gas phase. And that's basically what the general rule basically says, you know, the less the attractive force is, our strength of that attractive force between individual molecules, the much easier it would be to kind of convert it into a gas under normal conditions. Obviously the much stronger two molecules are held together, it's gonna to take a lot more energy and much more difficult to uh, kind of convert it into the gas phase. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Now we know some substances that normally exist as gases under normal conditions. And these are some of the ones we've talked about before. A lot of our diatomic molecules or elements here exist that way. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and chlorine. Those are all elemental forms and how they normally come. And they normally do come as gases. Uh, things like ozone here, which is good in certain cases in the environment and not so good in other parts. Also why we put sunblock on so we don't get too burnt um, <clears throat> is a gas that's O3. We also have uh, noble gases here, which is our group eight on the periodic table, our neon, our argon, our krypton, all the ons there. And those are monoatomic gases. They come as ones basically, as opposed to obviously things like chlorine, nitrogen, and oxygen which basically come as twos. So when we look at sort of the periodic table, you know, there's sort of a section of things that under normal conditions basically do come as gases and that's pretty much our hydrogen. Then obviously everybody kind of on this side here uh, comes naturally as gases. So when we talk about gases, there really is a difference between two words that are sometimes sort of used interchangeable, and that is a gas and a vapor. A gas is a substance that normally would be found in the gas phase um, under normal conditions. A vapor is something that is normally not found in the gas phase, but has been converted into a gas. And that is why if you think back to sort of the gas experiments we did the other week, uh, we talked about getting the water vapor pressure, right? And that's because when we talk about water in sort of the gas phase, we call it steam or water vapor. And that's again, because water is normally found in the liquid state and obviously is converted into the gas phase. When we talk about gases, obviously we were talking about the state of matter where pretty much everybody has broken apart from one another and they are flying around in a container. And as they are flying around the container, there are collisions that occur. And it is these collisions that basically um, cause the pressure that we associate with gases. So the more collisions that occur between the gas and sort of the container, the higher the pressure that we would ass assume that would occur and vice versa, the less sort of collisions that we have uh, that are occurring there between the gas and sort of the container, the lower the pressure uh, that we would assume to have. So pressure obviously is a very big measurable property that we, we talk about with gases. Um, by the way, air is mainly nitrogen and oxygen is second in terms of the actual gases that you have there plus some argon, carbon dioxide, and I guess wherever you're sitting at that point, whatever else is thrown in there. But the majority of it is nitrogen is made up of uh, air. Uh, one of the measurable properties of a gas, like I said, is its pressure, and it is related to the collisions that occur uh, between the, really in most cases, the gas molecule and the sides of the container. So as they're moving around and banging into that container, causing uh, those collisions that occur. Now, one way that we really do measure pressure is with a barometer. And a barometer is an instrument that measures pressure. Uh, old time barometers used to be a pool of mercury uh, with basically a tube that's in there. And basically what would happen is, as again, atmospheric pressure sort of went down on the mercury that was in the uh, barometer the mercury in the tube would start to rise and you would take a mercury reading. Mercury actually has an inverse meniscus. It actually goes upward in terms of that. 
So when you would read it, you actually would read the top of the meniscus. And in this particular case, uh, one of the most common ways that we would read it is there would be a ruler there on the side and you could read it in inches of mercury, mm, which is millimeters of mercury or centimeters of mercury, and you would take your barometer reading. Obviously, as we use in class there the other last week, uh, you have digital uh, barometers that you could use. We also have one uh, over the sink there by the oven is a barometer, more of an alcohol sort of barometer. Uh, there's a thermometer and a barometer that's hanging on the sink or above the sink there in lab. Um, so those mercury ones have been removed from a lot of places because they contain mercury, uh, but that's a very common way uh, the barometer used to be. And that gives us our sort of common units that we see with pressure. Uh, an ATM, uh, which is an atmosphere, is the probably most common unit of pressure that we deal with. A tor, which is named after the guy who invented the barometer, is equal to one millimeter of mercury. And again, that's basically because you would take that reading when you read the barometer. Um, and they are equal to each other in the sense it's a one-to-one -one relationship between a tor and a millimeter mercury. So if you have to do that conversion, you just simply change the units, the number stays the same. And this is our relationship between those three units. An atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 tor. So as we probably talked about the other day, uh, if you have atmospheres and you want millimeters of mercury or tor, you're going to multiply by that 760 and that will give you millimeters of mercury or tor, which again is a one-to-one -one relationship or vice versa. If you have millimeters of mercury or tor, and you want atmospheres, you're going to divide by the 760. We'll get you there in this particular case. There obviously are other units of pressure that we come across like uh, PSI, right? Pounds per square inch, uh, a Pascal or a kilopascal is another kind of unit of pressure. A bar is another common unit of pressure that you sometimes come across a bar and an atmosphere pretty much almost equal to each other. It's like 1.01 .01 equals one atmosphere. Uh, they're very close to each other. So I would say probably though in most chemistry classes, these are the big three units that you do come across, but obviously there are different units that you uh, could come across here. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> And again, here's some of those other uh, units, uh, pascals, pounds per square inch, um, one atmosphere. So one atmosphere is 14.7 PSI, and there are 760 conversions there. Our inches of mercury, which is a common way uh, you would read off a barometer, and that is our kilopascals there as a unit. <clears throat> There's a much, much prettier picture than the barometer I drew, but same idea here. Again, atmospheric pressure, mercury rising saying that you hear sometimes, right? Is again, the mercury rising there in the tube and you basically take a reading. The SI unit of uh, pressure is a Pascal. And again, here's the relationship. Not too much of use of Pascal's really too much in general chemistry and stuff like that. So, but in case you want 101,000 Pascal's or 101.3 kilopascal's. And again, we probably won't use Pascal's in here very much at all, if anything. All right, so let us talk about some gas laws here. And when we talk about gas laws, there's really sort of three variables that we deal with. Uh, we deal with basically when we talk about gases, uh, pressure, volume, and temperature. So these are the three sort of big things that we deal with when we talk about gas laws. And a lot of gas laws, we oftentimes will keep one of these things constant and sort of vary the others. Um, sometimes we'll kind of use all three of them together, uh, but these are the th big three that we sort of look at. So the first one is Boyle's law and Boyle studied the relationship between pressure and volume and he looked at pressure and volume and he held temperature constant in his experiments 
And what he found was that a fixed amount of gas at a constant temperature is inversely proportional to the gas pressure. So that's what it is. Pressure is proportional to one over the volume. It gives us this relationship that the volume is equal to K1 times one over P, which is PV equals K1. This is what is sometimes referred to as a proportionality constant. And basically what that means is if you did sort of like a Boyle's law experiment and you held the temperature constant, if you look at measurements for a gas and you always took you know, the pressure with the related volume at that point and you multiply it together, you will always get a constant number is basically what that means. So you always end up with a constant number if you're sort of following pressure and volume changes with the gas at constant temperature. And what that means is if you end up with a constant number, it allows us really to sort of get to really what is Boyle's law, which is you can kind of do a before and after situation because every time you do a pressure volume, they are equal to each other. And that allows us to get to really what Boyle's law is right there, which is P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. This is at constant temperature. The P's here are pressure. They could be any unit you like, as long as they are the same on both sides, so all the units cancel. The V, which is volumes here, same deal, can be any unit you like in terms of volume, as long as they are the same on both sides, so everything cancels out completely. Um, this is sort of like a before and after situation here, kind of, you know, you change maybe the pressure, you change the volume, and you can see how the other one basically reacts to it. There is an important relationship between pressure and volume, and it is this, as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down is basically what they saw, and vice versa, as the pressure goes down, the volume will go up. So that is basically Boyle's law relationship there. That's the inverse relationship. And if you just think about it, if you have a very small volume with all your gas molecules in there, there is gonna be a very good chance of a lot of collisions happening, right? Because there's not a lot of room for everybody to fly around in. More collisions, more pressure. As opposed to if you kind of gave everybody a lot more room to fly around in, right? It's gonna take longer for collisions to occur. Less collisions are probably going to happen. Everybody's got a little bit more room to kind of fly around in and you would start to see the pressure come down in that particular case. So you would have kind of less collisions here and you would see your pressure basically come down. So basically opposite relationships in Boyle's law. The relationship here is a good thing to keep in mind when you do some calculations to make sure you didn't screw up on your calculation. Everything sort of makes sense when you get there. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a proportional symbol. This guy right here, I think. It's supposed to be a proportional symbol. Yeah. And it's basically just saying this right here that it's the opposite relationship. Yeah, if one goes up, the other one goes down. Yeah. Other questions on that? And that's what we see from a graph here uh, for a particular gas. If we look at the volume here at much smaller volumes, we have a much higher pressure. As the volume increases as we go this way, it gives everybody a lot more room, less collisions start to occur, and we do see a significant decrease in the pressure that happens, and that really is sort of our Boyle's Law relationship. So why don't we try one here? An inflated balloon has a volume of 0.55 liters at sea level and rises to uh, 6.5 kilometers where the pressure is 0.4. Assuming the temperature remains constant, what is the final volume of the balloon? So take a minute or two, see what you come up with. Let's take a look at this. And uh, when you're dealing with gas sort of problems, the gas laws, it's a good idea to uh, sort of pull out the information from the problem and kind of label what everything is. And really what you'll be able to do is obviously probably help you pick the right gas law. Obviously, uh, we're going to do Boyle's law here since it's the only one we've talked about so far, but uh, we have 0.55 liters, which is a volume uh, at sea level, which is one atmosphere. That is a pressure. It rises to 6.5 kilometers, which is useless information. And it goes to a pressure that is 0 0.4 atmospheres. 
and we are looking for a volume here. So again, if you weren't sure, you could kind of see Boyle's law right there by just kind of labeling everything. And obviously we would be using P1, V1 equals P2, V2. In terms of units, we do need to check our pressures since we have two of them and they're both in atmospheres, which means we're good to go. Obviously, if one was atmospheres, one was inches, uh, millimeters of mercury, you got to do a conversion to either one. It doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter which ones you call one and two, it doesn't as long as you keep the numbers that go together together. So it doesn't really matter which ones you call. So in this case here, we would have our one atmosphere times our 0 0.55 liters uh, equals our 0 0.4 atmospheres and our V2. Obviously we're solving for V2. So we're going to take P2 to the other side, right? so that they cancel. In gas laws, when you move across the equal sign, everybody ends up in the opposite location, right? So really P2 is up on top on the right, ends up on the bottom left as you go across the equal sign. That's a quick way of rearranging equations. You have an equal sign. Basically, everybody ends up in the opposite location if you need to move them across the equal sign. Um, so we will be obviously dividing the 0.4 to the other side there. It gives us one atmosphere. 0 0.55 liters equals V2 divided by 0 0.4 atmospheres. The atmospheres here will cancel. That's going to leave us units of liters, which is good since we are looking for a volume here. So 0.55 basically divided by 0.4 gives us a V2 of 1.4 liters in this case. Any questions on that? Now, this is a case where, you know, if you understand the relationship of Boyle's law, what we see here when we look at the pressure is, in this case, the pressure went down, which means we should know the volume should go up. And it started at 0.55, ended at 1.4. So that makes sense based on what we know in terms of what's happening here with Boyle's law. So that's a good idea to kind of understand those relationships can help you make sure your, your answer sort of makes sense. Any questions on any of that there? Yeah. How did I, I'm sorry, how did I do? Uh, how, how did I solve for V2, is that what you're asking? Yeah, so we had uh, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. In this case, we pretty much had that guy, that guy, and that guy. So we wanted to solve for this guy. And typically whatever you're solving for needs to be by itself on top, if you will. So that means we kind of have to get rid of this guy, right? So we got to divide him to the other side. And he ends up over there. And again, if you want to do sort of the just arrow type of deal, we need to move this guy to the other side, which means he ends up on the bottom. You know, that's pretty much what will happen. Other questions on that? <clears throat> okay. All right. So the next couple of laws we're gonna talk about is Charles Law and Guy Lussac's Law. And Charles Law really dealt with the relationship uh, between volume and temperature. And he held pressure constant. Guy Lussac's law really dealt with pressure and temperature, and he held volume constant. So those are sort of the two gas laws that are very similar to each other, uh, except obviously one is dealing with volume and temperature, and the other one is obviously dealing with uh, sort of pressure and temperature. And when we think about what would happen in sort of each of these situations, what happens with Charles Law and the volume and the temperature and the constant pressure and sort of Guy Lussac's where we deal with pressure and temperature and the uh, volume is constant. I'll spit that out, I think. Um, let's start with the constant volume. If I had a constant volume and my volume in my container is not going to change and I have gas molecules in there, if I increase the temperature, will my gas molecules be moving faster or slower? They should be moving faster, right? The old saying, light a match under you, you start moving, right? So same idea. If you increase the temperature, gas molecules should be flying around faster. 
which means there should be more collisions occurring, right? Because they're flying around a lot faster. And in this particular case, my volume is constant, which means it's not gonna go anywhere. So we're going to have gas molecules flying around faster. We're gonna have more collisions when we increase the temperature. That all should result in an increase in pressure because of that. And vice versa in this situation, if we decrease the temperature, gas molecules are gonna to start to fly around a lot slower. It's gonna cause less collisions to occur. And basically we would actually see the pressure start to go down in sort of this situation here. Any questions on that there? So what happens in sort of Charles law where we have constant pressure, that means that we cannot have the pressure go up or down. So something has to happen, keep it at constant pressure. So if we take our same sort of box here with our gas molecule and we heat it up, a fine looking Bunsen burner right there. Um, if we start heating up, we're gonna have the same situations that's gonna occur as below. We're going to have our gas molecules starting to fly around a lot faster, gonna cause more collisions. So what happens in Charles Law situation is the volume actually expands. So what ends up happening is even though they are flying around a lot faster, they have a lot more room to fly around in. And what that ends up doing is keeping the number of collisions relatively constant. And that obviously would then keep the pressure relatively constant. So what we see in Charles Law is as the temperature increases, the volume will also increase to maintain the pressure and keep it at constant pressure and vice versa. If we lowered the temperature, we would have our less collisions. So when we lower the temperature, what happens is the volume actually comes down to keep the level of collisions occurring. So it kind of squishes everybody together, keeps the collisions occurring at the same rate. And we actually see that the volume will decrease with it. So in the bottom case, the volume is stuck in place, it's rigid. So as we increase that temperature, we do see the pressure kind of change, uh, either go up with increased temperature or go down with decreased temperature. But in the situation where we wanna keep it at constant pressure, we do have the volume basically adjusting to maintain the constant pressure. Any questions on that there? Now, there's an important relationship when we look at a graph of what happens here. Let me see, I think the graph is next. We'll look at it first and we'll go back to that page. If we graph volume versus temperature in sort of a Charles Law situation, and you do it for any gas that you like, and you basically extend those lines back to the temperature scale, every single gas ends up at the exact same number, which is minus 273.15 degrees Celsius. That number looks familiar. That is the number that we use basically to do what? 273 is the number we use to convert to Kelvin. So Kelvin was a guy to sort of recognize this. He called this absolute zero because if I convert this to Kelvin, I'm going to add 273.15 and gives me zero Kelvin, which is absolute zero, yes. So Kelvin recognized this fact and because of that, you could thank him because pretty much every single gas law that you ever come across, if you have temperature, it needs to be in Kelvin. So you gotta always make sure that the temperature in gas laws are in Kelvin 100% of the time. I don't personally know of any gas law that does not use Kelvin for the temperature. Even in questions where they may try to trick you in books, they will give you the temperature in Celsius they will ask you to give the answer in Celsius. So people think, well, they gave it to me in Celsius. I need to give the answer in Celsius. I could just put it into the gas law in Celsius. You cannot do that. You will get the wrong answer. So you have to go convert it to Kelvin, put it into the gas law, and then convert it from Kelvin back to Celsius for the answer. So 100% of the time, because of this relationship, uh, what we see is that the temperature always has to be in Kelvin. And again, that is basically our a reminder, like we see there, Kelvin is 273 plus our temperature in Celsius there uh, will allow you to do that. Any questions on that there? 
So uh, Charles Law and Guy Lusick's Law and some other laws that we see that involve temperature, um, again, always needs to be in Kelvin. That's a very common mistake people make. They leave it in Celsius. So make sure you don't do that for sure. Like normally, you, you could kill the uh, 0.15 part of that number and just use obviously 273. You're okay, like normal. So let's take a look at really what those laws are for each of these guys. And we do get the same sort of proportionality constant that we saw uh, with Boyle's law. If you take the volume divided by the temperature for any situation with the same gas, it will always equal the same number. That allows us really to put it together. And this is really sort of Charles law here. And that is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. And the main importance is obviously, as we just talked about, and as it says there, temperature does need to be in Kelvin. And that's obviously on both sides. It needs to be in Kelvin. Now, Guy Lusick's law. Is P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. And this is at constant volume. This is obviously at constant pressure. And these are the relationships that we talked about. Again, as the pressure goes up, so does the temperature. And as the pressure goes down, so does the temperature for that guy. And down here, volume goes up, so does the temperature. And volume goes down, so does the temperature as well. So those are the important relationships for both of those guys. And obviously up here for Guy Lusix as well, does need to be in Kelvin. Now, in terms of the pressures uh, for the top equation there or the volume for the bottom equation, again, doesn't matter. It could be any unit of pressure or any unit of volume. Again, as long as they are the same on both sides, so all the units cancel. So that's the important part there. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> all right, so let's take a look at one here and, and try, I think. In an experiment, 452 milliliters of a gas is used in a light bulb. It's heated from 22 degrees Celsius to 187 degrees Celsius. What is the final volume? So take a couple of minutes, see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so now we got a few gas laws to choose from. We got our boils. We got our Charles. Our guy that's very similar there, P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2. So uh, again, if you're not sure which one to use, we pull out the information. We obviously have a volume that is 452 milliliters. Um, it is heated from 22 degrees Celsius uh, to 187. And we are looking for a volume. So again, just kind of pulling out the information, clearly none of these would work since there's no pressures involved. So we can kind of even kind of see almost uh, Charles Law there. As was a question that was asked earlier, even though they're both in the same units of temperature here, you gotta go into Kelvin to get the correct answer regardless of that. Um, so here we do wanna make sure that we do convert our temperature to Kelvin. We're gonna do a 273 addition on each of these guys. And uh, that will get us a 273 plus a 22, gives us a 295 Kelvin, and a 187 plus a 273 gets us a 460 Kelvin. At this point, we are good. We could call the first set of guys ones, if you like, and the second one twos. That means when we look at V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2, we are actually looking to solve for V2. So again, quick way is that's just gonna go to the opposite location and that will give you V1 T2 divided by T1 is equal to V2. We're basically multiplying T2 to both sides. It's essentially what we're doing there. At this point, we wanna make sure that we actually put the correct numbers in the correct locations. Also a very common error. Uh, people put T1 in the T2 spot and so forth. So here we are looking for our V1, which is 452. Our T2, which would be the 460 Kelvin, divided by our T1, which would be the 295 Kelvin. 
and that would equal our V2. Here, the Kelvin and the Kelvin will cancel. We'll leave us units of milliliters, which is good since it's a volume. That is going to get us a 460 times 452 uh, divided by a 295 over there. We'll call it like a 705 milliliters would be our answer here. First off, any questions on the calculation part? Again, understanding the relationship that is here when we see Charles Law and we look at what's happening with our temperature, our temperature is going up, which means we would expect our volume to follow and also go up. We started at 452, it went up to 705. So again, it makes sense based on the relationship that we should be seeing here with Charles Law. And that's also, again, like I said, a very good way to check yourself because very common people kind of invert numbers a lot of times when they're doing these calculations. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right. Well, our good friend Avogadro, he had a number, but I think he wanted a gas law as well. So I think that was his dream. So Avogadro does have a gas law. I know I talked to him. It was his dream. It was. <laughs> so when we think about Avogadro, I said Avogadro. When we think about Avogadro, uh, we think about moles, right? One mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So why would his gas law not involve moles? And it actually does. This is actually at constant temperature and pressure. So under constant temperature and pressure conditions, we get uh, Avogadro's law here, which is V1 over N1 is equal to V2 over N2. N is the moles, basically. So N is moles, obviously moles of gases here. There's sort of an interesting relationship with Avogadro's law, which is basically as the moles increase, so does the volume sort of increase proportionally to it. And uh, as we will see a little bit later on this chapter, it will allow us to uh, sort of bypass some parts of the calculation when we're doing stoichiometry that happens under constant temperature and pressure. Uh, what we can do is if we look at an equation that's all gases, And from an equation, right, we normally could do our stoichiometry relationships and go, hey, there are two moles of A gets us one mole of B. We could do, right, two moles of A gets us three moles of C and so forth. If this was occurring at constant temperature and pressure, we could actually come up with a relationship that actually involves volumes. So a lot of times when we're dealing with gases, we're interested in how much volume of gas you collected, kind of like your experiments, right? You're interested in how much of the volume of the gas you actually collected. So we actually can, if we have sort of a gas stoichiometry relationship here, uh, use sort of Avogadro's relationship to go, that is like two liters of A is equal to two liters of, um, of sorry, of one liter of B. Uh, we could say that for two liters of A, we get three liters of C. So instead of like a mole to mole relationship, we could kind of do a volume to volume relationship as long as it's under constant pressure and temperature. And it will allow you really to bypass using a gas law to figure out how much volume you would collect and so forth. And we'll see this a little bit later on in some examples here in this chapter. So uh, that's sort of one consequence of Avogadro's law is sort of this relationship of moles and volume uh, sort of being equal to each other in a sense when we're under those constant pressure and temperature conditions. Obviously, the volume here in the calculation on the bottom can be any volume unit you want, and clearly the moles need to be in moles uh, to do that. And that's what we see here. Again, uh, as I was just mentioning, we could do sort of a volume to volume relationship and is equivalent to like the mole to mole relationship. So again, we could say one liter of H2 gives us one liter of Cl2 or two liters of HCl. And again, we could almost do a stoichiometry relationship under these constant pressure and temperature relationships. Now, putting together all those wonderful gas laws that we talked about, our Boyle's, Charles, Avogadro's law, 
we got the granddaddy of them all, which is the ideal gas law. And it is obviously a gas law that works for ideal gases. You may be saying to yourself, what is an ideal gas? Well, it's pretty much every gas we deal with. We assume sort of ideal conditions. And we'll talk a little bit about what that is later on this, in this chapter. Um, pretty much all gases that we deal with in this class will be ideal gases. If you take Chem 1A, you will talk about real gases, unlike these fake gases. You'll talk about real gases, which, uh, do behave a little bit differently. We really only get into sort of what is sometimes called real gases um, when you get really high uh, pressures and really low temperatures. So you get that sort of big extremes. But under normal conditions, most gases will behave ideally. And ideal gas law is PV equals NRT. It is different than all the gas laws we've seen up to this point. There is like a no before and after type of situation. It is a one and done situation here. One pressure, one volume, one temperature, one mole. And it is also the most restrictive in terms of units. If you are using the ideal gas law, the pressure has to be in units of atmosphere. The volume has to be in units of liters. Moles should be moles or something is really wrong. And temperature, like everything else, does need to be in Kelvin, if I can spell that, Kelvin. And the reason why pretty much everybody needs to be in those specific units is because of R. R is the gas constant. And it is a value that you always have available to you. Although in a lot of problems, they will not tell you, hey, R is this. They just assume that you know what R is. So you always gotta keep in your head that you do have that sort of available to you. R is uh, 0 0.08206. The units are liters times atmosphere divided by Kelvin times mole. And that is why everybody else needs to be in those units so that everything properly cancels out. People will nowadays round this number and use it as 0 0.0821. You could use either number is fine. I use this number because that's what they beat in my head and I can't get it out as much as I try. So, you know, but a lot of books and stuff will now use more of the rounded number, the 0 0.0821. Um, and again, either one's fine. The good news is somewhere on the paper, you probably have this number given to you with the units, which is a nice reminder in case you forget what the units of this guy should be. You can just look at the units of R and it will tell you pretty much obviously what everybody else needs to be in for it to properly cancel out. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Yes, it will definitely be on the paper somewhere. Unless I forget, then it won't be on the paper, but I'll try not to forget, but it, yeah, it's usually on there. But it, again, in problems and stuff like book problems, and stuff like that, it's usually not mentioned at all. So, you know, you just got to remember that you always sort of have that number and you can look it up obviously in the book if you needed to. Other questions on that? <clears throat> okay. Now there's a couple of other sort of important relationships and gases that we're going to talk about here and sort of how we use them. The first one is, uh, we'll start with STP. STP, as we talked about, I think in lab, is stands for standard temperature and pressure. And when it does stay under STP conditions, what it means is they are actually giving you a temperature and that temperature, as it says there, is 273 Kelvin. And that pressure is really one atmosphere. So again, sometimes in a problem, they'll just say add STP conditions or something or add STP. And you're like, well, where's all my numbers? And again, it is actually giving you two numbers that you could use. You could stick it into the ideal gas law, obviously using the temperature at 273 and the pressure at one atmosphere. Now, there is a really nice relationship that occurs when you are at STP and only at STP is what this is over here one mole of any gas will equal 22.414 liters. So this conversion factor here can only be used if you're at STP, which means you gotta have that temperature at 273, it has to be one atmosphere for the pressure. If it is not at STP, you should never ever use that, equation, that little conversion there. Yeah. The good news is you can use the ideal gas law at STP conditions, non-STP conditions, you could use it for any conditions, the ideal gas law. So if you're unsure if you should use that in a particular situation, don't use it, just go use the ideal gas law and you'll be fine. The benefit of that conversion is if you happen to be at STP conditions, you could bypass the ideal gas law 
and just do like a conversion. And that will a lot of times allow you not to have to use it. And you can kind of quickly calculate something that you're looking for. So it's sort of a quick conversion at SCP conditions that allows you not to have to use the ideal gas law, but you absolutely could use the ideal gas law in any condition that you need. Any question on that there? <clears throat> This is also really how we get to the gas constant. If we take the ideal gas law, which is what this is, and solve for R, and put in all the conditions under STP, that would be one atmosphere, that'd be 22.4 liters, that'd be one mole, and 273, that's essentially where the gas constant actually comes from. This R value, that 0 0.08206, is the gas constant that we use for gas laws. Later on, there is, a few different versions of R, like 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. That is one that we use for energy type calculations that we don't use in this class, but you will use in 1A and stuff like that. So there are some different versions of R. So if you look around and you like search R, you will see some different values, but the one that you definitely should use for gas law purposes is this one here, the 0 0.08206 number. Don't use any of the other ones, otherwise your units are gonna be way, way wrong and you're gonna be off on your number. All right, well, all that build up, let's do one here. Calculate the pressure exerted by 1.82 moles of SF6 gas uh, in a vessel that has a volume of 5.4 liters and a temperature of 69.5. Not sure what to use in terms of gas laws. We are obviously looking for a pressure. Uh, we have moles given to us. Uh, we also have a volume and we have a temperature which is 69.5 degrees Celsius. So just kind of peeking at that, that should kind of really point you to the ideal gas law. Clearly we don't have two of anything else so we can't use any of the other ones. So we definitely will be using our PV equals NRT here. Uh, in this particular case, we are solving for P. So we basically need to bring the V to the other side and that will give us P is equal to NRT divided by V. We wanna look at some of our units here. So moles is good, our volume is in liters, so that is good. And much like a problem here, our Celsius there does need to be converted. Uh, so we're gonna do 69.5 plus a 273. Uh, so here we will add 273 and that will get us a 342.5 Kelvin. Remember that although not mentioned in the problem, like usual, we always have R available to us, which is also a missing piece. So at this point, we now have everybody in the correct unit. So putting it in would give us 1.82 moles, R 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere Kelvin mole, our temperature of 342.5 Kelvin, divided by our volume of 5.43 liters. The moles here will cancel, the Kelvin will cancel, the liters will cancel. That is gonna leave just atmospheres left in terms of the unit, which is good because we're looking for a pressure. 1.82 times 0 0.08206 times a 342.5 divided by a 5.43 gets us a pressure here of 9.42 atmospheres, which is a pretty big pressure there. First off, any questions on the calculation? <clears throat> now, uh, a couple of variations of this, uh, volumes are oftentimes given in milliliters, kind of like how you collected your gas, right? So doing the milliliters to liters conversion is a very common thing that you need to do. Also, a lot of times you're given things in grams. So converting grams to moles using the molar mass is also another common sort of step here that you sometimes have to do, obviously, before you get it into the ideal gas law. Any questions on that there? Yes. R is just a constant, so you always have it. So it's always that number. It's always sort of available to you. Yeah. And again, like I said, uh, a lot of times they just don't tell you anything about R in the problem. So they just assume you know you have that available to you. Other questions? Okay. So there is a gas law that really deals with all three variables together. And it's actually the one that we uh, kind of talked about in that lab we did, I think with the hydrogen gas. And it really is derived from taking really the ideal gas law 
and solving for R in each case, R, which is obviously the gas constant, right? So these two numbers are the same, which means you could put both of these guys together. And in most cases, what happens is if you don't open the lid, the gas is not going to escape, which means the moles of gas that you have in there will be the same. So what this gets us is to this equation here, which is sometimes referred to as the combined gas law because it pretty much combines all the variables together here. And it is P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. Uh, the pressure here on both sides could be any unit. Again, as long as they are the same, the volume here can be any unit, as long as they are the same. And like normal, our temperature does need to be in Kelvin. This is the one I would say gives most people a very difficult time rearranging. So again, just going opposite locations is a good way to kind of rearrange what you need. This is also a really uh, good one to uh, remember when you are maybe trying to think about having to remember all the other gas laws, because essentially, If you remember this one and you understand what is happening in the other gas laws. So for example, if you are at constant, oops, oops if you have something to write with, I suppose that would be good. If you're at constant uh, temperature, all you have to do is like do a scratcheroo there. And that is uh, Boyle's law right there. Yeah. If you are at, <clears throat> constant volume, for example. You take out your volume and there's your P1, T1 is equal to P2, T2. If you're at constant pressure, you take out the pressure and you're left with V1, T1 equals V2, T2. So from sort of combined gas law, you pretty much take out the thing that's constant or it's not changing and you could have pretty much all the other ones that we talked about. So it's a good one to remember and just you can get to all the other ones really quickly that way. If you don't wanna remember them sort of individually. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> all right, so let's try our uh, math skills here. Let's see how I do. All right, so uh, a sample of oxygen gas, 27 degrees and a volume of 9.55 liters and a pressure of 2.97. We changed the pressure to 8.25 atmospheres and heated up to 125. What is the new volume here? Okay, let's take a look since we're getting to the end here. Uh, consider the temperature here. So we have a temperature of 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, we have a volume that goes with that of 9.55 liters, and we have a pressure of 2.97 atmospheres. Uh, we then change the pressure there to 8.25. Uh, we also have a temperature of 125 degrees Celsius, and we are looking for a volume. So again, by just sort of putting everything labeled, that should hopefully point you in the direction of the combined gas law, which is really kind of the only one that has all those guys together. Uh, that means we got a uh, P1V1 over T1 equal to P2V2 over T2. In this case, we are looking for V2. So again, if you wanna kind of do the quick conversion there, that means we gotta take V2 to the top and bring P2 to the bottom, basically. That will give us P1 V1 T2 divided by T1 and P2 will equal our volume. We're basically multiplying T2 to both sides and dividing by P2 to the other side. Yeah. Any questions on that rearranging? All right, we want to check units here. So we got atmospheres on both sides is good. Our temperature obviously does need to be converted. So that is going to be a 2727 plus a 273. That's going to be a 300 Kelvin for this guy. And it's going to be a 125 plus a 273. That's going to be a 398 Kelvin in this case. 
that is everybody we need. So we want to put everybody in the right spot. So we're going to start with P1, which is 2.97. Our V1, which is 9.55 liters. And again, here we actually want T2 up on top, which is 398 Kelvin, divided by our T1 on the bottom, which is 300 Kelvin, and our P2, which is 8.25 atmospheres. The Kelvin up on top and bottom will cancel. The atmospheres up on top and bottom will cancel. That's going to leave us, obviously, only liters up on top, which is OK, because that is a volume. So multiplying everything on the top, coming back and dividing by what's on the bottom there gets us, looks like a 4.56 liters, again, would be the unit, as that is the only unit that is left here. Any questions on any of those things? If rearranging equations are difficult for you, you should take some time to make sure you properly know how to rearrange them, because uh, obviously you need to be able to solve for any of the variables that are in any of those sort of equations. Any questions on any of that? That's laws. All right, so the next thing we're gonna kind of talk about with gases is actually stoichiometry uh, involving gases and uh, stoichiometry that involves gases uh, really does work the exact same way as stoichiometry that doesn't involve gases. Uh, it's really in a basic gas stoichiometry problem, uh, those four steps that we talked about, which is you want to make sure that you balance the equation. If it's not, you want to convert to moles. You want to do the actual stoichiometry part, which is the mole to mole relationship. from the balanced equation. And lastly, you want to convert moles to some other unit. And just like uh, regular stoichiometry problems, it is possible to have a limiting reagent problem as well that involves gases, and it works the same way. So again, if it happened to be a limiting reagent situation, obviously around there, you want to figure out which one is the limiting reagent uh, before you sort of proceed. So really sort of the meat of the stoichiometry sandwich here is basically the same. It is just a little bit different on a lot of times these two steps, basically. And the difference oftentimes will come from how we get to moles or at the end, how we get to like volume or something like that. And it will usually involve using the ideal gas law somewhere along the way. So somewhere along the way, it will usually involve using that ideal gas law. If you typically use it at the end, you most likely are going to be solving for volume. Not 100% of the time, but in most cases. If you use it up front, you most likely will be solving for moles if you kind of use it up front. And again, uh, so these are very common places they're using it. I would say probably this part is the most common. Like at the end, you use it and solve for uh, the volume of gas you collected. So kind of like the experiment we did the other day where you collected all that hydrogen gas. Um, one way you could solve is actually use the ideal gas law and do some stoichiometry. Um, but uh, that's the main difference between it. And everything else is basically the same. So why don't we look at one here together to sort of see how we go about this approach. So <clears throat> if we have this reaction here, P4 plus uh, 4H2 makes a product, what is the volume of hydrogen gas at 27 degrees Celsius and 1.25 atmospheres that is required to react with 5.65 grams of phosphorus? So if we do follow sort of our stoichiometry steps, um, you know, the first thing we would want, obviously, is the balanced equation, which clearly here we have. We are given some information about sort of hydrogen gas, right? So that is obviously the gas here we're looking for. So if we think about the gas and some of the values that go with that, we have temperature that's 27 degrees Celsius. We have a pressure that is 1.25 atmospheres. Uh, we are looking for a volume in this case. So this is a case where we're going to use really the ideal gas law at the end for hydrogen. Uh, we're going to use PV equals NRT. And if you just sort of check off sort of what is given to you and what you have, it will kind of help you with that. So we obviously have the pressure, we have the temperature. Again, we always have R. 
and we are clearly looking for the volume here. That means really the one thing that we are missing for hydrogen to do this is the moles of hydrogen. And that is really where the stoichiometry part of this problem is going to sort of come into play. We're gonna use stoichiometry in this case, basically to figure out how many moles of hydrogen we started with. And then once we have that, we could go into the ideal gas law at the end there and solve for volume. Any questions on sort of where we're going with this? Now, we clearly kind of use this information, use this information, which means that is really the only piece of information we kind of have left that is sort of not gas related, if you will. And we would then follow our second step in stoichiometry, which is take whatever they give us and convert to moles, right? And in this case, we do need to do that. So we would start with 5.65 grams of P4. We would go to the periodic table and look up phosphorus there, which is 3097. And we would use the molar mass for phosphorus to convert it into moles. So that is four times 3097 grams per mole. Again, that is the molar mass from the periodic table is where that number comes from. Uh, that gets us uh, something like, it's 123.9 by the way. So 5.65 divided by four times 3097. Gets a 0 0.04561 moles of P4. So here, all I'm doing is converting the grams into moles because I ultimately need moles for my ideal gas law. Do I need the moles of P4 though? I don't need the moles of P4, right? Because we're looking for hydrogen gas. So this is again, where the stoichiometry part comes into play. We're going to do our third step, which is go to the equation and find the relationship between P4 and H2, which looks like for every one mole of P4, I get four moles of H2. And that would be our next step here. We go 0 0.04561 moles of P4 using our stoichiometry here, uh, one mole of P4 on the bottom, four moles of H2 up on top, and that will get us, we'll call it 0 0.182 moles of H2, which is the missing piece that I need up here for the ideal gas law. Now that I have used stoichiometry to get me to the moles of the H2, I do have everything I need now to basically use the ideal gas law, which is a very common in gas stoichiometry problems. That fourth step is you kind of use the ideal gas law here. So in that fourth step, we're going to use PV equals NRT. We're going to solve for volume. So the volume would be NRT divided by P. We do need to still check some units here and uh, the pressures in atmosphere, so that's good. Obviously our moles are in uh, moles, so that's good. But much like usual here, right, we do need to do that conversion for our temperature and take it to Kelvin. So we're gonna do a 273 plus a 27. It's gonna give us 300 Kelvin on that conversion. So now that we have everybody in the right units, we just got to put it in there and that would be 0 0.182 moles, 0 0.08206, which is our gas constant that we always have. And our temperature, which is 300 Kelvin, all going to be divided by the pressure, which was given to us at 1.25 atmospheres. Kelvins will cancel. Moles will cancel, atmospheres will cancel. It's gonna leave us liters as the unit that is left at this point. And uh, let me write it up on top, maybe so it'd be easier to see in this room, yeah? Uh, so we have volume uh, will be Rn, which was, we got there, 0.182. Worst room design for lecturing ever, this one. <laughs> Can we put any more obstacles in the way of the actual Lord? <laughs> That's it. Uh, we had 300 Kelvin up on top and our pressure was 1.25, right? 
there you go. That might be easier to see, I hope. All right, so uh, we're going to take uh, 0.182 times 0 0.08206 times 300 divided by 1.25, and that's going to give us a 3.58 liters as our amount of hydrogen gas that would be produced in this particular case. Any questions on any of that there? <clears throat> so again, you could hopefully see uh, what you can see in this room uh, was the same four steps. We want to balance the equation, convert to moles, multiple relationships. So really the first three steps were pretty much identical to a normal stoichiometry problem. And again, a lot of times this is the main difference. Instead of maybe using molar mass at the back end there, uh, you use the ideal gas law and figure out the volume. Any questions on any of that one there? Did I uh, say one time the ATM? Uh, there was for, uh, for the R? Yeah, it's it's over here on the bottom. Yeah. So no, those are all the units that go with R. So R has like four different units associated with it. And the units are basically liters times atmosphere up on top, divided by Kelvin times mole. All four of those units go with R. And they go with R so that when we put it in, like we just did here. Pretty much everything will cancel except for one. Yeah. Yep. Other questions? Okay. All right. So, why don't you try one here, which is uh, pretty much what you did in that experiment? You took some magnesium, you added some hydrochloric acid, there was bubbles, there was ooze, there was oz. And you want to calculate the volume of uh, hydrogen gas produced at STP if you started with five grams of magnesium and excess HCl. So give it a try. This is pretty much the identical calculation of what you need to do for that lab. Do for the theoretical yield for that experiment 17, based on the mass of your magnesium that you had. Obviously you didn't have five grams. In this case, we are looking for the volume of hydrogen gas, which obviously is a gas. As out of STP conditions, again, that means that the temperature is 273 Kelvin. The pressure is one atmosphere. Remember, we always have R. So, you know, if we look at it again, the ideal gas law here, we have everything pretty much we need except for the moles of the hydrogen gas. So very much like the previous problem here, we're gonna kind of approach it uh, using the only other number that's there, which is the five grams of magnesium. So we're going to do a stoichiometry problem to go from magnesium moles to hydrogen moles, then we obviously could use the ideal gas law to do that. So first step there, we got our balanced equation. Second step is we're going to convert here to moles using the molar mass there from the periodic table, uh, 2431 grams per mole. Going to get us... Call it uh, 0 0.2057 moles of magnesium. Remember that we're not really interested in magnesium, but we need hydrogen. So that is again where the stoichiometry comes from. It is a one to one relationship between those two from the equation. That makes it pretty simple there. That's going to be one mole of magnesium on the bottom, one mole of H2 up on top, giving us point two zero five seven moles of h2 any questions up to there <clears throat> at this point we now have found our, again our missing sort of guy that we need so this would be like step three we now could roll into step four here again we're going to solve for volume which would be nrt divided by p Putting in our moles, which is 0 0.2057, our R 0 0.08206 liters, atmosphere, Kelvin, and mole. Our 273 for our temperature, all divided by one atmosphere for our pressure. 
Again, atmospheres will cancel, moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel, leaving us liters. And we end up with 4.61 liters of H2 would be produced. So again, this is pretty much identical to the calculation uh, that you need to do for experiment 17, number one on the table for theoretical yield. Any questions on that? Yes. You absolutely could. That would be my next sentence, but yes, you could use that. Uh, we could solve this another way because we are at STP conditions. We actually don't need to use the ideal gas law. Uh, I got another page here, hopefully. Yeah, okay, yeah. Let's do it here so people can see it. So because we were at STP conditions here, we could use that one mole is equal to 22.414 liters at this point. And we could have just picked it up with the moles of hydrogen, uh, which was 0 0.2057. So 0 0.2057 moles of hydrogen. And again, because it is at STP conditions, we could have avoided the ideal gas law and just rolled with this conversion. And we would get obviously the same answer, 4.61 liters. So you absolutely could have used it in this situation. It's a good reminder that if you didn't think about it or weren't sure if you could, you could obviously still use the ideal gas law like we did there as well. Any questions on either way there? <clears throat> Again, a friendly reminder one more time that you should only use that at STP conditions. If it is not STP conditions, do not use it. Yes. Any questions on those stoichiometry problems? So really, again, sort of the same basic steps, just uh, somewhere along the way, you're going to use that ideal gas law. Again, if you use it up front, probably going to solve for moles. If you use it on the back end, most likely, like we did here, going to solve for volume. Now, another sort of relationship in terms of stoichiometry does occur when we are at constant temperature and pressure. So as we talked about earlier, when we hit a constant temperature and pressure situation involving stoichiometry, um, we can revert back to our friend Avogadro, who, as we talked about earlier, I had many conversations with. And we can use Avogadro's law and sort of his relationship to sort of shortcut the stoichiometry calculation and make it a little bit easier uh, without having to necessarily use the ideal gas law. Again, in this situation, you can still use the ideal gas law if you don't remember this sort of relationship or how to do it. So just to sort of show you it that way first, you can still approach it as a stoichiometry problem. Here, the temperature is 450 Kelvin and five uh, atmospheres for the pressure. So if we wanted to know the volume of nitrogen gas, uh, if we reacted with uh, nine liters of hydrogen gas, we actually can just approach it stoichiometry wise like normal and use the ideal gas law. We are given nine liters of hydrogen gas. So in this case, starting with the hydrogen gas, which is really what we're not interested in, after we have the balance equation, we can use PV is equal to NRT. And in this case, if we think about the hydrogen gas that's given to us, we have the pressure, uh, we have the uh, volume, we have R and we have the temperature. That is what I was talking about earlier, that if you use the ideal gas law early on in the stoichiometry problem, you would be solving for moles in this case. So we would be using this to solve for moles, which would be PV over RT. And again, this is all for hydrogen, which is what we're sort of starting with in this reaction here. And the pressure is five atmospheres. The volume is nine liters for the hydrogen. Our R, which is 0 0.08206. And our temperature, which is 450. And if we do all that, this will give us how many moles of hydrogen we have which would be five times nine divided by 0 0.08206 divided by 450 
gives us about 1.219 moles of hydrogen. Remember though, that we're not interested in hydrogen, but we're actually interested in nitrogen gas here. So this is where the stoichiometry would come into play between nitrogen and hydrogen. It is one mole nitrogen gives us three moles of hydrogen. So we would use that like a normal stoichiometry problem here. And again, three moles of hydrogen, one mole of nitrogen. That is going to convert us into moles of nitrogen, which is what we're interested in, which is 0 0.0406 moles of nitrogen. So this is really like the stoichiometry problem we were talking about, but here we're actually using the ideal gas law up front, step one. Step two is again, using the ideal gas law to get to moles instead of like grams of mole or mass. Step three here, doing our mole to mole sort of conversion from the equation. And now step four, we're actually going to use the ideal gas law one more time here for nitrogen. And what we're going to try to solve for is the volume of nitrogen. So I'm just gonna go up high so hopefully people can see it. Uh, so we're gonna use PV equals NRT for nitrogen. And in this case, we wanna solve for volume, which would be V is equal to NRT over P. And at this point, the pressure and the temperature is still the same. So still the 450 Kelvin is still the five atmospheres. The uh, R is obviously the same and the N is what we just solved for there. Um, so flipping it here, volume equals NRT over P. So our moles was uh, 0 0.0406 for the nitrogen. Our R is obviously the same R. And in this case, our temperature is the same. Was it 450 the temperature? I think. Yeah. And uh, our pressure is five atmospheres. So this would be like the fourth step here, using the ideal gas law at the end to solve for volume, which is really common. So 0 0.0406 times 0 0.08206 times 450 divided by five gives us approximately uh, 0 0.2998 liters, which is like 0 0.3 liters in this particular case. <clears throat> I didn't mess up any of the calculation there. No, one sec here. I want to make sure I punched everything in right here real quick. That's where I'm off. I have an extra zero. I'm sorry about that. Is 0 0.406. There we go. So moving that there, extra zero, not necessary here. 0 0.406, gonna move me over to three liters. That's much better. There we go. Sorry about that. <clears throat> All right, so we get three liters here, which would again be our fourth step. If you kind of did a traditional sort of stoichiometry uh, procedure, again, step one, the balanced equation. Step two here, we're using the ideal gas law to solve for moles. Step three, the mole to mole relationship. And step number four here, using the ideal gas law on the back end of the calculation to solve for volume. First off, any questions on doing it this way? Don't screw up and write the wrong number. It's good enough good advice. All right. Now, there's a much simpler way of doing this problem because we're at constant pressure and temperature. And that is, again, using our relationship that we saw when we were talking about Avogadro's law. Because this is at constant pressure and temperature, we simply can do a liter to liter relationship 
instead of a mole to mole relationship. And that means that we could actually start with our nine liters of hydrogen. And from the equation, from the coefficients, we see that for every three liters of hydrogen, we get one liter of N2. And that it would be exactly the same way as you would do a mole to mole relationship. And because it's at constant pressure, that's pretty much all you would need to do. You could take the nine liters of H2 and use that liter to liter relationship and do three liters of H2 on the bottom, one liter of N2 on top. And lo and behold, we end up with three liters of N2, which is super easier than doing the ideal gas law at both ends of the steps. So this is sort of the benefit of Avogadro's relationship here. And again, you can only use this in a stoichiometry problem if the temperature and the pressure remain constant. So if those two guys remain constant for everybody, you could just bypass sort of all the big stoichiometry part there and jump to a volume to volume relationship. And it's a much quicker way of doing it. If not, you could still obviously use the ideal gas law and you end up with the same answer provided you don't write down the wrong number. Yes. Any questions on that part of it there? All right, so why don't you try one here? What is the volume of sulfur dioxide gas uh, will be reacted when 12 liters of oxygen is consumed at constant temperature and pressure via this reaction here? All right, so in this case, uh, we're looking for the volume of sulfur dioxide, which is this guy that will react when 12 liters of oxygen, which is this guy there. Uh, is consumed at constant temperature and pressure. So in this case, they actually didn't give you any numbers. So you obviously probably won't be able to kind of do the ideal gas law version. The good news is you could just really go right to the equation at this point, which is balanced. And just like we would do a mole to mole relationship, we could say from the coefficients that that is two liters of SO2 gives us one liter of O2. So identical to how we do mole to mole in this case, because of the constant temperature and pressure, we could come up with that volume to volume relationship, uh, which will allow us to pretty much directly calculate what we need. So we got 12 liters of oxygen, using that as really a conversion factor here. Uh, one liter of oxygen will give us two liters of SO2. Liters of, S of O2 will cancel gives us 24 liters of SO2 in this particular case. So these are really nice kind of quick uh, stoichiometry problems that you could do when you're looking at sort of a volume to volume relationship that involves gases. As long as it's constant temperature and pressure, it's a good way to go. Any questions on stoichiometry involving gases? Cut. So next thing we're going to talk about is uh, sort of what was going on uh, when we did those experiments, uh, which is partial pressures. Uh, Dalton Law of partial pressures sounds very difficult, uh, but it's really not a, a very difficult concept. The idea here is if we have a container that has like only one gas molecule in it and that A is flying around, then the total pressure of that container is going to be pretty much a result of only the pressure exerted by gas A. Oftentimes, though, gases do come as mixture of gases. So maybe we got A gas molecules, B gas molecules, C gas molecules kind of flying around in the same container. All those different gas molecules are going to collide. There's going to be collisions. And they all basically are going to be contributing to the overall pressure of that mixture where in this case, the total pressure would be the pressure of A plus the pressure of B plus the pressure of C in this case. Because they are each contributing to the overall pressure, they are what are referred to as partial pressures. That's basically what it means. They are partially contributing to the overall pressure of that mixture. The total pressure in a laboratory situation is what you did here, the barometer reading. Yes, is basically where you get your total pressure from. How do we get the partial pressure of each of these gases? Well, the most common way to get the partial pressure is the ideal gas law. And PV equals NRT 
gives you nrt divided by v you would essentially just do the ideal gas law in the case on the right three different times one for a one for b and one for c And once you figured out each of those individual pressures, those would be the partial pressures of each of those gases, you simply just add them together and that will give you your total pressure for that mixture of gases. The good news is that it is a mixture of gas, which means all three of these guys are flying around in the same container, which means the volume in every single calculation is identically the same. Also means that that container is sitting in the same room, which means the temperature for all these gas calculations will be the same. And obviously R, which is a constant, will be the same. So really the only difference that you typically will need to do in a partial pressure calculation is to figure out the moles of each of the gases and put the correct moles in. All the other values will still be the same for everybody because they're all in the same container. You just got to also obviously make sure everybody's in the correct units for the ideal gas law. Any questions on that there? That's pretty much what this says. So again, we could do this and you might be wondering, well, isn't there multiple gases? Aren't they sort of interfering with each other and stuff like that? So earlier we talked about the idea of ideal gases. And one of the things that makes something an ideal gas is the idea that even if you have different gases near each other in the same container, in an ideal situation, they will pretty much ignore each other. They won't interact with each other. They won't basically be interact, repel, collide with each other. It is almost like you could imagine each of those gases being in the container by themselves. And that's sort of what an ideal situation is. That's really one of the things that makes something an ideal gas is the idea that there is no interaction between other gases. There's no repulsive forces. There's no attractive forces. So that's why we could actually do these type of problems like this where uh, everybody is in the same container and we can basically just do it separately. So why don't we try one here? five grams of helium plus five grams of neon in the same container. What is the partial pressure of each gas and the total pressure here? Uh, helium is 4.003 and neon is 2018, it looks like. In the same container flying around, uh, which means the volume for each of these guys will be 2.5 liters and the temperature for each guy will be 27 degrees Celsius, which we automatically know we should convert to Kelvin, which would be 300 Kelvin. Now we have five grams of each of those things. It's going to get rid of some of that. So it could write a little bit higher up there on the screen. So basically, if we think about the ideal gas law, as we talked about, we can use it for each of the gases individually here, even though they're in the same container. Uh, so obviously we have the temperature, we always have R, uh, we are looking for the pressure and we have the volume given to us. So we do need to figure out the moles of each of those gases to begin with. So we had uh, five grams of helium and that is uh, 4.003 grams per mole from the periodic table. That gets us uh, five, 4.003. 1.25 moles of helium. We also want to convert our grams of neon into moles as well, because we need it. Uh, that's 2018 grams per mole. So five divided by 2018 gives us uh, 0 0.248 moles of neon. Any questions so far on that? <clears throat> That is really the missing piece that we need for each of the gases. So like I said before, even though they're flying around together, the ideal gas part of it means you can think of them as being in there by themselves. They really won't behave or interact with each other. So we're going to first solve for the pressure here of the helium, which would be NRT divided by V and putting in our numbers for helium, which is 1.25 moles. Our R, which is our constant, 
our temperature converted to Kelvin, which is 300, all divided by our volume, which was 2.5 liters. Everything's gonna cancel out except for atmospheres here. So that will give us uh, 1.25 times 0 0.08206 times a 300 divided by 2.5. And that's gonna give us approximately a 12.3 atmospheres. The 12.3 atmospheres represents the partial pressure of helium in this particular case. Any questions on that calculation there? We're going to do the exact same calculation for neon. The only difference is we're going to use the moles for neon. And that would give us the partial pressure of neon would be our 0 0.248 moles, which again is our moles for neon. Every other value is going to be exactly the same since they're in the same container. And if we do that there, we end up with a 0 0.248 times 0 0.08206 times a 300 divided by a 2.5 gives us a 2.44 atmospheres. That would be the partial pressure of neon in this particular case. Any question on either of those two calculations? How would I find the total pressure? Yeah, the total pressure is just found by simply adding those two together. So the total pressure would be 12.3 plus 2.44. And that gets us 14.7 atmospheres. So uh, this is a very common sort of partial pressure type problem. It really is just an ideal gas law where you solve for really each of the gases individually. And when you do that, because they're in a mixture, they're considered partial pressures rather than just pressures. And the total pressure added found by adding it. The major contributor to the pressure in this mixture is which gas? It is the helium at 12.3 atmospheres, right? The reason for that is, anybody have a guess? The reason for that is in the molar mass, helium is four grams, neon is 20 grams, helium is much, much lighter, which means it is flying around a lot faster and causing more collisions. It has a higher velocity, which when you go to 1A, you'll calculate the velocity of things like this, but it has a much higher velocity and moving around a lot faster, causing more collisions than the slower moving neon. Any questions on this type of partial pressure problem here? All right, hang in there, almost there. The second type of uh, partial pressure situation happens just like it did in the experiments that we did. And that is, as we talked about, when we do create our sort of collect gases where water's involved, as we talked about, we, in addition to the gas that we collect, we get basically water vapor that occurs. And that's just a reaction of, or a combination of basically collecting your gas like we did in water. So as the reaction is happening, obviously it's gonna heat up some of that water. So we get the gas we're interested in, but we also get water vapor that happens as well. And this is really two gases that end up in the same location. This is really a partial pressure situation that occurs. So as we talked about when we did those experiments, and as you wanna make sure that you do when you do the calculations, we do have to basically correct for the vapor pressure of water, because although we did collect the water, we're really not interested in it. In the example of the magnesium and the hydrochloric acid, we were interested in just the hydrogen gas that we collected. In the case of the second one we did, we collected oxygen gas. And in both of those cases, because we basically collected the gas with the water, we got basically some water that came along uh, basically for the ride. And there's your sort of the line. So an easy way to sort of correct this is the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the gas you're interested in plus the vapor pressure of water, which is what this is, the vapor pressure of water. 
This, as you know, and as you hopefully got off of this list, if you didn't, you might want to take a picture of it. By the way, you might want to take a picture of it since you might need it for a post-lab question, I think on one of those, the vapor pressure chart, just in case. Um, you can look up that value in an actual table. So what we typically end up doing is, this is a very easy partial pressure situation. This is a subtraction that basically occurs, the pressure of the gas is equal to the total pressure minus the vapor pressure of water. The total pressure in your situation, as I mentioned before, is the barometer reading or the atmospheric pressure. That is basically your total pressure and obviously the vapor pressure of water you find from the table. That is the exact experiment that you did, I think, pretty much. And you created obviously the oxygen gas here, went through the tube, came up through here, got the oxygen gas, but again, the result of that was you got the water. So it's really important when you use the pressure in those calculations that it is just the pressure of the gas. You got to do that correction to take off the vapor pressure of water so that you have the right pressure. So in a problem like this, a sample of oxygen gas is saturated with water vapor at 30 degrees Celsius. The total pressure is 753 torr. The vapor pressure of water at 30 degrees is 31.824 torr. What is the partial pressure of the oxygen gas? So this is basically a very similar situation to what occurred in that second experiment as well. In a book problem, how do you know it's sort of this situation? There's a couple of key words and these are the key words. It's saturated with water vapor or it says something like you collected it over water or something like that. So something that involves water is usually the key that you have to use that relationship that we just saw, which is the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the gas plus the vapor pressure of water. In this particular case, the total pressure is 753 torr. The pressure of the gas that we're interested in, and they were nice enough to give you the value here in the problem. A lot of times they are not nice like that. And there is a table in the chapter usually that you might have to look it up. Again, very much like the table that's hanging up there on the wall. Um, and it's based off a of temperature, just like you did over there. And in this case, it would be 31.824 torr. Rearranging gives us the pressure of the gas is equal to 753 torr minus the vapor pressure of water. And if we did that, we would end up with 753 minus 31.824. Gets us approximately 721 torr. They do want it in atmospheres. So to convert torr into atmospheres, we divide by 760. And that gives us 760, 0 0.949 atmospheres. This would be the pressure of the gas that has taken the water vapor out of it is sometimes referred to as the pressure of the dry gas because you have taken away the uh, pressure because of the water. This is definitely the pressure that you would want to use in any calculation. So in both of those experiments in 17 and 18 for the hydrogen gas, you want to make sure that you do this correction and then for all the pressure for the hydrogen gases you need to use in a gas law, you need to make sure you use the one that you've subtracted off the water vapor pressure. Same thing with the other one, which is the oxygen gas. You got to make sure you subtract it off. And then for all the rest of the calculations that involve the pressure of the oxygen, you need to make sure that you are using just that one and not the one that has not the total pressure from the barometer. Any questions on that there? Okay. So the last thing we're gonna talk about here is this little chart here, which is the kinetic Mucker theory of gases. We've kind of talked about a, a number of these things, but these are really the main parts of it. Uh, gases are obviously very tiny particles or either atoms or molecules. Uh, the particles are really small compared to the distances between them. So number two here is one of the things that makes something an ideal gas law or an ideal gas is the idea that we assume that the actual volume of the gas itself is zero 
compared to the container. The container's volume is much larger than the actual uh, gas. So that is something that is sort of an ideal situation. If you think about a lot of problems that you read, they talk more about the volume of the container that things are in rather than this is the volume of the gas. And that's the reason why in an ideal situation. Particles are in constant motion. They're colliding with the walls of the container. Obviously these collisions, as we talked about, is what causes the pressure. The more collisions, obviously the higher the pressure, the less collisions, the lower the pressure. And number four here is the second thing that makes it an ideal gas is basically why we could do our partial pressure calculation. They're assumed to have no attractive or repulsive forces between different gases. So again, even though there's maybe a mixture of different gases in there in an ideal situation, which is pretty much every situation, unless you get to really extreme pressures or low temperatures, uh, they really will not interact with one another. It's only at those high pressures and low temperatures, you get real gases as we talked about earlier today um, that they do interact, but we definitely don't come across any of those in here. Uh, the average kinetic energy of the gas molecules is related to the temperature. So as we talked about, if you increase the temperature, the gas should be flying around a lot faster. If you lower the temperature, it should be obviously moving a lot slower. Any questions on our big gas 